welcome everyone to the Justice in 100 scorecard webinar uh, hosted by the Initiative for Energy Justice. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, my name is Melissa Sontag. I am the Technology Communications and Research Coordinator for the Initiative for Energy Justice. And I'm joined today by three great panelists, uh, Sivan Devar, the Director of the Initiative for Energy Justice, Haley Havens, Solar Equity Research Associate for the Initiative for Energy Justice, and Marielle Theray-Hingham, uh, Clean Energy Policy Lead at Front and Center. And just as a disclaimer to everyone, this recording is, or this webinar is being recorded, um, and the recording will be uploaded to the Initiative for Energy Justice website. Uh, within a couple of days. And so for anyone who is not familiar with the Initiative for Energy Justice, or IEJ, uh, we are a policy research organization founded in 2018, and we work to offer concrete energy policy solutions focused on energy equity. And we do this by providing law and policy resources to advocates and policymakers uh, to advance state level transitions to equitable renewable energy. And so we're gonna be discussing one of those resources today, uh, the Justice in 100 scorecard. Um, this scorecard serves as a rubric for evaluating 100% clean energy laws passed by states and territories. And the tools in the report range from a simple one page framework all the way to a 46 point worksheet of uh, concrete policy mechanisms. So we'll be going over that. And we'll also br briefly uh, introduce the scorecards companion report the Justice in 100 metrics, metrics Report, which is an inventory of equity metrics for the implementation of 100% clean energy policies. And both of these are available on the Initiative for Energy Justice website. Um, I will drop a link for people uh, to quickly access those in a minute. And then during the second part of the webinar, uh, we'll transition to Marielle from Front and Center and she's going to talk about the social justice dimensions of implementing Washington State's Clean Energy Transformation Act. Uh, Front and Centered is a state level coalition of groups led by communities of color, and they helped ensure that this act included specific equity requirements. So their work serves as an example of what energy uh, equity looks like in practice. And then we will conclude with a question and answer session. So uh, again, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. Um, and then we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible uh, during that session. So all of that out of the way, I am going to go ahead and kick it off to Sabin and Haley. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for our looks like, including us, 100 attendees. Um, like Melissa said, I'm going to provide an introduction and overview of these two reports that we've recently um, published, the Justice in 100 Scorecard and the Justice in 100 Metrics. It's more so going to be like a teaser to the metrics and focus on the scorecard, but wanted to, to just uh, let you all know about it and uh, get you interested in, in digging in and diving deeper into those reports if you haven't already. Um, again, my name is Sivan Devar and I'm the Director of the Initiative for Energy Justice. Uh, and I um, am pleased to work with uh, a great team on the uh, development of these reports. I'm just going to share some slides here in a second. Um, bum, bum, bum. Right. I'm going to go into the development and methodology of the Justice in 100 scorecard in particular. And I'm gonna hand it off to my teammate Haley um, in a little bit. Um, she's gonna talk more about the mechanics that go into using the scorecard rubric that we've developed. But before I dive in, just a very quick primer to the issue of energy justice. Um, I sometimes refer to energy justice or energy equity as uh, this two part um, question of who benefits from the transition to renewable energy and how much do those people benefit. Another way to look at energy justice is that it's it attends to the benefits and burdens of the energy system and looking at whether there's a fair uh, share and spread of those benefits in particular. Energy justice is really integrated into the long history and tradition of environmental justice, which grew into climate justice, 
um, and now intersects with energy justice or energy equity. Our work covers a few different um, areas. The topics that we're going to talk about today focus on 100% clean energy laws or 100% renewable energy laws. Um, and we're also focused on other areas of the electric sector and how equity is centered in those areas. Um, but we'll dive in to the 100% clean energy laws and, and it paints a picture for exactly what it means to talk about an equitable transition to renewable energy. Um, and the spectrum of how on one end are we advancing energy democracy and really centering agency, um, community governance and control of the energy system. Um, and at a bare minimum, are we giving folks affordable, affordable access to energy and alleviating energy poverty and reducing energy burden? But the Justice in 100 project is our effort to dive into the question of energy justice when it comes to 100% clean energy laws. Uh, and, and in this area, what we've decided to look into in particular is in many states across the country, there's a transition um, already at play. And there are states that are trying to pass laws to shift either their electric sector in particular or their whole economy to 100% renewable energy or 100% clean energy. But there's a lot of ways that you can do this. And it's not inevitable that these transition will happen in a way that advance social, racial, and economic justice. And so the Justice in 100 project from the uh, Initiative from Energy Just for Energy Justice um, is working on two uh, avenues, both the legislative um, and regulatory implementation of these policies, um, as well as the evaluation and data and metrics uh, that continue to look into how policies are going and evaluate them. So today, the Justice in 100 Scorecard project um, and the, the scorecard report focuses more on the first part and it is a, a scorecard that aims to uh, illuminate how policies in different states are, are doing, how well they actually center um, equity in the transition to 100% clean energy. The scorecard overall is a couple of goals um, and we're presenting now um, after finishing the first phase of this work and we'll say more about the second phase. But the first goal was to develop an equity centered scorecard for states and territories that have made 100% clean energy commitments. Um, and the reason for doing this is to both help uh, other states and territories that are considering passing such laws know how they can do so in a way that really advances social justice, um, as well as to help those states that have passed laws to think about how they could be improved. And so today's webinar reviews the rubric and the scorecard that we developed that, that completes the first phase of this effort. And what we're in the midst of is applying this scorecard to 10 different jurisdictions that as of last year um, had passed some form of a commitment to 100% clean energy. And so we, um, we're still working on that portion of scoring these various different jurisdictions um, and want to tell you about the scorecard that goes and the methodology behind that scoring. A little bit of some background in the timeline that's led us to this point. Um, after the initiative was founded, we brought together um, stakeholders from around the country for an energy justice workshop in 2019. And that led to the creation of an energy, just, energy justice workbook and an energy justice scorecard in early 2020. And I'll say more about what that framework is because that underlying framework is what the Justice in 100 scorecard is built upon. Um, we had an advisory group process that helped us think through and iterate the rubric for the Justice in 100 scorecard, which we released earlier this year. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to continue to work on the actual scoring and hope to release those scores this fall. Um, and I'm not actually able to see my chat, but if anyone else is having issues with the um, Melissa or any of the other panelists, if, if anyone else is having issues with volume, just let me know, just speak up so, since I can't see the chat. Um, so the scorecard, the Justice and Wonders scorecard, like I said, is based on this energy justice workbook. It's also primarily 
um, pulling in a lot of material in the comprehensive building blocks for a regenerative and just 100% policy report, which is this framework that came out around the same time um, that really talks about in detail some of the elements for equitable 100% policies. And so the idea came up to sort of combine these, um, these reports as well as to look at other sources. Um, but I wanna start with what the Energy Justice Workbook put out and the Energy Justice Scorecard that is the underlying framework for our Justice in 100 Scorecard. That work was based on um, synthesizing the, the work um, and analysis of frontline groups and academics, the scholarship, um, looking at all the different aspects of how energy justice and energy, ju uh, energy equity are described and what the key components are. And ultimately, we landed on three key areas of justice, um, restorative justice, procedural justice, and distributive or substantive justice, which are the underlying pieces of um, our scorecard framework. And just briefly, restorative justice is primarily attends to ensuring that the that an energy just that the energy system is acknowledging and remediating prior harms to low income communities and communities of color in particular, especially black and indigenous communities. Um, and procedural justice attends to, to ensuring that traditionally excluded groups and frontline communities are at the center of making policy in the energy system and at the center of decision making. And distributed justice is about ensuring that energy is more accessible, affordable, and democratically managed for all communities while centering marginalized communities through the equitable distribution of benefits and burdens. So this three-part framework, we further fleshed out into five questions. The first question around process relates to procedural justice, the second question around restoration and restorative justice, and then three questions that break out different elements of substantive justice. And so this is the initial just one page scorecard that we put out in 2020. And um, it asks five specific questions in those areas that I, that I mentioned. Um, and I'm sharing this because the Justice in 100 scorecard is, is very large and it's very big. But to really get your head around it, you really need to just understand these five questions because the whole scorecard, scorecard boils down to these questions. So for the question process, we ask, have marginalized communities participated meaningfully in the policymaking process with sufficient support? And as Haley will describe, we have a whole worksheet and all this guidance to help answer this question when it comes to the area of 100% clean energy policies. And ultimately, we answer this question on a scale of one to five, from straight no to this question to a yes and um, answers in between. The second question we ask is, does the policy aim to remedy prior and present harms faced by communities negatively impacted by the energy system? Third, around decision making, does the policy center the decision making of marginalized communities in implementation? Fourth, around benefits, does the policy center economic, social, and health benefits for marginalized communities? And fifth, around access, does the policy make energy more accessible and affordable to marginalized communities? So starting with that energy justice scorecard and that framework of five questions that we developed now um, over a year and a half ago, like I mentioned, we started to bring other sources in to do a deeper dive to how would you specifically answer those questions in the context of 100% policy. And the what we refer to as the building blocks document, um, shepherded and edited by the 100% network, but led and authored by frontline community leaders is the underlying source for a lot of the content to, that builds out the worksheet of our um, Justice and Wonders scorecard rubric. But we also reached um, into uh, various different tools and resources, particularly from movement-based organizations and the climate justice movement that have been developing analysis of the solutions that are needed and really um, building on this existing body of work, we are trying to not recreate the wheel 
but look into this work to identify the areas in which um, equitable policies are already um, prescribed and how could we map those all into a way to create a rubric and a scorecard for 100 percent apologies policies so a little bit more about our process um, and then I'll, I'll wrap up this section we also um, uh, like i mentioned brought in an advisory group it was about 30 individuals from around the country um, most um, most of whom were in states that had passed some form of 100% clean energy policy. And so with that group, we shared a, an early draft of our scorecard rubric. We workshopped that. We did an early evaluation of states just to test out whether the rubric, even in its very early draft form, made sense, whether it needed to be tweaked, um, and then got additional feedback focusing on whether the scorecard was usable and, and how it could be really useful for um, communities. And so with that, I will transition it over to Haley, who will share a little bit more about the mechanics of how to actually use the rubric. Hi, Sabin, thanks for that. Um, great, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the details of what you might find if you jump into our scorecard report. Um, if this one page scorecard is our end product, then we have developed a five page worksheet that can help be seen as a tool to answering each of these five questions, where each row in the scorecard um, has an entire worksheet page devoted to breaking apart criteria in order to get to that answer. Um, Next slide. Great. So on the right side of the slide, you can see the worksheet for the restoration section. Um, and the way you'd work through it is you'd go down through it and you would read each criteria and lay it against the law and give it either full or partial or zero credit on a scale of zero to one. Um, and if you run into any complications along the way, you can jump down to the bottom of our scorecard report where we have a 47 page reference document. And this document isn't necessarily to be used reading straight through, but you sort of bounce back between this document and the worksheet as needed. Um, so for example, on the next slide, you might get to number two ensures 100% transition off of fossil fuels. And you might say, hmm, okay, how would I really look at this renewable portfolio standard and decide if it, it gets full credit, partial credit, or zero credit. Um, so you'd scroll down to that document and the next slide will show our criteria. Um, and so you can see here that to be considered a full transition off of fossil fuels, we wanna see a ban on all extractive energy systems and combustible fossil fuels. So that would include thinking about transportation and, and moving cars off gasoline. Um, the transition should be broader than just in the energy sector and should have specific provisions around transportation, buildings, homes, land use, agriculture. Importantly, it also should address existing loopholes and exemptions um, that allow continued pollution, particularly in marginalized communities. And then we also add context that shows where we got these criteria from and the other reports that you can dive into um, in order to read more deeply into each criteria that we've pulled together. Um, so once you've completed that, you go back to your worksheet and you put down your score and you work through that for that entire sheet until you tally up what you have at the bottom. So in this case, you'd see we have a hypothetical six out of 13 score for restoration. And a point I wanna lean into here is throughout this entire process, uh, a lot of the focus was not on the actual numbers, but on the evaluation of the law. So I took a lot of notes when I was per particularly using this in my way and um, writing down the substantive items of the law and then creating sort of analysis and using those to help formulate these scores. So once you have those scores and you have your context and your analysis, you take that back to your one page scorecard um, to the restoration section. And that's the information that you can use to assign a score one through five. Um, next slide. Great. So one being no, you got, you know, three in the middle is somewhat and then five is like, yes, this is does awesome. It, it really hits a lot of our criteria. Um, 
And we very intentionally didn't create sort of a formulate range of, you know, five to eight equals somewhat, because it really does depend on the context of the specific law and not all of the criteria are particularly weighted the same or are equally meaningful in the various jurisdictions. Um, so once you've gotten there, you go on to have your um, little summary. So you have in the column of worksheet points, it shows how many points on that worksheet were satisfied and then you boil down sort of all of your notes to this, this one answer, um, one sentence summary of that section and why that score was given and then the score. So in this case, we would have a three out of five, which would be somewhat. Uh, we also are going to be releasing another version of the same scorecard where um, instead of a short answer, we'd have a long narrative, which would be closer to like a paragraph. And that way you can get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty details around um, where that score came from. Um, some final notes too about how to use the scorecard, even though it is laid out like a worksheet and there is a numerical focus, we really intend this to be a thought tool and not a calculator. Um, hopefully having it be a resource for guiding the evaluation of legislation and really around helping you ask questions. So thinking about does this equity criteria exist? And if it does exist, to what extent has it been done well? Um, and then how are both we defining well, others in the energy equity space defining well, and, and hopefully leaving room for you to be asking that same question to yourself too. What do you want to see happen? Um, to identify areas for improvement in the laws or replication, maybe identify pieces that were missed in legislation and, and should try to be salvaged in rulemaking. Um, to create points for comparisons between laws, maybe you see something really awesome happening in a jurisdiction and you're like, there's precedent for this, I want this to happen here. Um, and to facilitate conversations. Um, so now that we've gone through the scorecard, talk a little bit about um, where we're at in the timeline for scoring. Right, so in February and March is where we um, drafted our original scores. So we did this through reading the legislation um, and then we moved into a four month uh, feedback round where we were connecting with uh, community-based practitioners in all of our jurisdictions, um, both to get feedback on some of that initial scoring, but also to get context that we couldn't um, learn from just reading the le legislation. So to find more about what the lawmaking process looked like and who was involved and what outreach looked like and was it meaningful. Uh, and with that information and another dive back into the legislation, we are now in our second round of, of draft revisions for the scores. We were just finishing them up. Um, so that moving into one more round of feedback, this one is probably gonna be a little bit more written oriented. Um, and we're gonna be discussing after the webinar um, areas for how we can reach out about that if you wanna get involved in that. Um, and then moving to writing and publication. So I'm gonna to toss it back to Subin to talk about the metrics a little bit. Hey, thank you so much. Um... And as you guys can see, the scorecard is a lot going on to it. And so appreciate you um, joining us to give you that intro. I can't do the same. We can't do the same for this other report, but we did want to just at least mention it. And, and so you know that it's out there. So the Justice in 100 metrics um, focuses on if everything that we did so far was focused on the evaluation of the legislation that authorized a state to make a commitment to 100%. Um, and in, in that whole effort, we're not analyzing it, the implementation. The metrics report we put out to help with the implementation side. And it, in short, it uh, provides an accountability framework to be able to look and see, okay, are the utilities that are making this transition? And is the commission that is regulating all these utilities, are they actually making progress? How do we hold them accountable? What are metrics of um, energy equity and energy justice that we can look at and say, are we making progress towards those? So we provide in this um, report um, a list of different utility actions towards equity as well as equity indicators in a few different key areas um, and demonstrate the logic model of what needs to happen. You need to be able to measure these ultimate outcomes so that you can hold utilities accountable to do X, Y, Z um, so they can measure ultimately, are they meeting interim targets? And ultimately, is there a change in the equity indicators um, that are part of the report? 
Um, the report doesn't mean uh, for it to be an exhaustive list, of course, just a, an example um, of, of the many indicators that are already out there. So, um, you know, there's no reason to, to say that, there, that this isn't possible. Um, and just briefly, that report is also, um, you know, focused on a whole framework of what should drive equity in implementation. And I'm not going to go into this more. I'm going to hand it off to Marielle um, because her work really gets to the heart of the implementation of clean energy policies in um, a specific state. Uh, this, this little diagram of restorative justice to meaningful participation and adequate reporting and accountability mechanisms was a framework that we developed together um, by uh, working with Front and Center and in their work in Washington State. Uh, so I will stop there and hand it back off over to Melissa to introduce Maria. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen and Haley, for all of that super important information. Um, and yeah, let's move on to Marielle, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen and we can get started on, on your portion. All right, I think, I think you can see. Um, thank you. Oh. Not going too fast. Thanks for the intro, Melissa. Um, name is and Mariel Theresingham. I'm clean energy policy lead with Front and Center. And Front and Center was involved in passing 100% clean energy in Washington, um, the Clean Energy Transformation Act. Um, so just a brief overview of um, what I'll be discussing. Our experience uh, with CETA, setting it up, um, the rulemaking, and now implementation. So we're two years into um, seeing this law. Um, in action kind of after it having been passed. And so I'm going to speak to um, some of the process and um, some of what we hope will come out of it and also some lessons learned um, and where equity actually appears in the law um, and how we're getting to equity metrics, which are the primary um, form of accountability and defining specific actions and obligations that um, the primary um, entities that have to act under this law, the utilities have um, to achieve a more equitable transition to clean. Um, so some distinguishing characteristics of CETA, um, it's basically a three-part schedule um, and the ultimate goal is full clean energy, um, greenhouse gas neutral by 2030, kind of a step along the way, but 100% um, clean by 2045. And so that's, the schedule is intended to ensure that um, utilities are taking action as soon as possible to get towards, um, to arrive at that outcome by kind of the 2045 date, if not sooner. Um, and it is possible. There are a mix of fuel sources um, that are supporting the electricity system in Washington and CETA only applies to um, electricity um, for clarification. Um, so, there are coal, coal not um, coal fire, fire plants in the state, but coal fire generation um, is source for a lot of the electricity um, that serves Washington, um, but also hydro because we have um, some strong uh, dam systems and, and waterways um, that support that. So some utilities, a number of utilities already um, on their way or primarily clean. Um, but the equity obligations apply across the board. Um, other utilities and some of the large ones in the IOUs um, have, have a lot of way to go to arrive um, at the 100% clean um, kind of goal. And what the law does is um, like the equity dimensions in particular are it expands obligations for energy assistance. So while the transition has to happen according to the schedule and according to an, a number of stipulations, um, and other obligations. The utilities are required to provide um, assistance and make energy more accessible for, um, for residents in, in Washington, primarily low income residents. And so it, it um, adds some definitions around eligibility there um, and what assistance looks like, bill assistance to um, other forms of um, energy burden reduction. So Washington 
has a number of utilities who provide electricity to um, the population, a mix of consumer owned and investor owned. Um, and it's about 50-50 actually. So a little under half of um, Washingtonians are served by um, kind of investor owned or for-profit utilities, primarily in um, around the Seattle area um, and not in Seattle proper, but around the Seattle area and Spokane area and, and Yakima area. So you can see in this um, top map from the clusters of higher population concentration. Um, and those are some of the um, larger urban centers um, around the state and where IOUs are more prominent. Um, and they are held to higher standards by the Utilities and Transportation Commission, um, who sets the rules for um, how kind of CETA will be um, implemented, specifically what um, the IOUs have to do. Um, and they have to, uh, they have a higher um, standards for kind of reporting, um, and for the specific actions that they have to take to comply with clean energy and also with doing that equitably, um, providing the assistance and, and other forms and other um, kind of more specific um, types of obligations that I'll discuss. Um, the COUs, they have a lot more flexibility. Um, the Department of Commerce sets some of the rules for them but um, and oversees it, but um, there's not as much of an accountability mechanism, whereas the UTC, the commission for the um, for-profit utilities can ultimately approve their plans, the plans that they have to create for how they're going to achieve um, the, the 2045 goals and, and all the goals along the way um, in four-year increments. Um, those plans have to be very, have to be quite specific, um, have to like, specify how they will do it equitably um, and metrics are a key part of that. And, if those like those plans have to be approved um, by the commission and that's the primary form of accountability that um, the investor owned utilities are held to and so that is to say the utilities that service about half of washingtonians have a higher standard of of um, that they're held to for compliance um, with the equity obligations in particular um, just because of how authority is sort of allocated to um, these different regulatory bodies in Washington. And that's definitely an area that as, um, as advocates, we are, we are pushing is for rethinking kind of power dynamics um, a bit to ex um, not kind of expand broadly um, state authority as much as ensure that there are standards so that um, utilities, small utilities, large utilities, wherever, which, whichever geography, they all have many different um, kind of situations that they're facing in terms of how they get their resources and who their populations are and how many kind of low income customers there um, are being served and customers with other um, forms of vulnerability. Um, and that makes for quite a complex system in Washington, but um, there is, um, that's a lot of what kind of the stakeholding process and um, rule making ongoing conversations are about and that's what front and center to advocacy and advocacy from some of our partners um, is continuing to push forward trying to just high standards across the board um, and so I wanted to say key lessons learned are partnerships are so critical um, front and centered is we're a coalition um, of over 75 organizations in Washington led by and serving the interests of communities of color um, and we're kind of the climate justice um, we, we focus on the climate justice um, elements of policy advocacy and also capacity building for community organizations to um, to work more on climate justice um, and um, and make sure that the interests of their community members um, are are being heard in policy form and decision making form and that ownership um, and um, resources are reaching community members. And in you know, the case of energy, a lot of that is related to um, energy generation um, and distributed energy um, ownership that is community based. Um, a lot of our partners are kind of within the coalition and other um, people, um, organizations that are led by um, communities of color and a lot of environmental organizations that are white led um, who are showing up because this isn't a, this is massive legislation for um, the environmental um, outcomes that are hoped for or at least um, kind of restraining some of the emissions generated by the energy sector um, and then environmental organizations have additionally like a number of them been really critical partners just for making sure that 
the equity message is is being heard from kind of different different groups of stakeholders who have different degrees of um, relationships with regulators and um, and familiarity with kind of a lot of the technicalities um, of how the energy system works. So when front and center talks about equity, the regulators um, in um, utility bodies, they say, okay, yes, front and centered. Um, and then when this again, other key partners are also kind of repeating that message, it gets amplified. Um, and that's how it really appears in, in the rules when a number of you know, key stakeholders are really putting it forward. So um, nurturing the coalitions has been really important, showing up in all of the stakeholdering processes. Um, we were formally invited in a number of cases. Um, and I'm, I can say that in Washington, we have a pretty friendly towards um, kind of advocates environment. Um, we, ha we can have meetings with commissioners. Um, we are consulted by um, other kind of stakeholders and regulatory bodies um, as they try to understand what the law means and what they have to do. Um, and so leaning into that, bringing in um, coalition members um, as, as possible and making sure that the equity messages get reiterated is a really big part of um, what has what has led to any success that we found um, in really having some robust like um, equity provisions. Um, and so equity first, just making sure that message is, is raised and um, put forward so that where the clean energy and the equity are, are married and fused and it's not a matter of siloing and um, creating a two track system um, and education. <laughs> constant ongoing education um, around equity. Um, high level, that is, um, it, it can feel a little, not, daunting's not the word, but um, frustrating when you feel like you keep being brought into some of the high level discussions of equity to the point where it feels like you have to defend equity. Equity is important. Oh, tell us why, what is equity again? Um, why isn't equity just uh, energy assistance? and getting more energy assistance to people um, and how are there other dimensions beyond affordability and access, although those are critical. Um, and so being having those conversations um, and ensuring that learning is happening, I, I think that's, um, that is, I mean, the, the lesson learned is, well, we're still learning it, like how to do that effectively, not, um, and not, be kept, um, not allow things to just be kept at the high level. Um, and then just shaping the power. I alluded to um, how authority and power is um, allocated differently between different regulatory bodies. Um, and then just the, the, the actual dynamic, the de facto, and how things are done, who has the ear of the governor, or you know, what, um, where pressure can be applied, to the legislature, legislators um, and other um, kind of key decision makers and governance um, entities. Just understanding that landscape um, has been really important uh, for advancing um, kind of the equity message um, and some specific asks that we have we have had in how impl implementation needs to look to get um, to make sure we have an equitable transition. So just to speak a little bit to um, what uh, is going on in CETA, the Clean Energy Transformation Act, the energy assistance component expands. Um, the energy um, assistance requirements that utilities um, have to bring where they have to offer it to. Um, where low income, the definition of low income is, uh, is expanded to 200% of the federal poverty level um, or 80% of the area median income, the higher of, um, and that all utilities must demonstrate progress towards um, providing, like, towards reaching over 90% of energy assistance need met by 2050. Um, and then, the equitable distribution of benefits component is where it's the newest feature of CETA or of, of the whole kind of legal landscape around um, clean energy and energy. Um, and it's trying to understand where there are impacts um, from clean energy transition operations and from how utilities operate um, in general, how, there are, how that impacts communities differently. And those disparate imp impacts need to be understood and analyzed. Um, broken down by who is affected differently, um, the most highly impacted communities and the most vulnerable populations, and 
then solutions need to be crafted towards arriving at more equitable outcomes, um, pushing back on those disparities and raising the kind of standards, the health um, standards, environmental standards, um, and resiliency and energy security, um, and access to non-energy benefits, including um, in the economic sphere and governance area. So utilities are required to do more, do more around equity in all of these areas. Um, but the only definition is basically that type of language. Um, and so the rulemaking was really important for fleshing that out. And I would say it got a little bit further. Um, and so I just have a breakdown of an energy equity flywheel that was produced by the um, um, Havan, Shaban, Havan Shaban and the um, Empowered Data Works team um, who are kind of big advisors for some of the equity, for kind of the equity um, obligations primarily on the energy assistance side um, for utilities. Um, and their, the bigger focus is on data um, and understanding exactly what are these impacts. Like utilities have to shift their mindset from, we just provide, you know, we just provide um, electricity at the cheapest price possible and that is it and that is fair, or that is good. Um, and then what is real fairness? Um, and how do you really account for the costs of what you do, not just the kind of monetary costs that, um, are broken down in kind of the, the 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 old way of doing things or the kind of the standard way of doing things. So really, the part of transformation, that part of the CETA um, idea, is um, kind of pushing back on that. And I'd say the work, of, the advocacy work, is is keeping that pushing going um, because you can tell on the regulatory side and the utility side, wanting to default to the familiar is that just kind of keeps happening. Um, pushing against some of this, uh, the equity language and dimensions that feel a little conceptual um, or too qualitative. Um, and if not pushing back, then wanting to step in, but just not knowing how. So some of the guidance from the IEJ report um, that was discussed, um, I think has been really helpful um, from some other, um, some other thinkers in this space um, and also some of the cases that IJ drew from um, for how equity has been sort of measured and understood in other forms of, um, of, of um, and, uh, other kind of cases around the country from um, how different utilities and different types of um, public services are um, allocated, are, are beneficial and are reconfigured in order to um, account for equity, not just the standard performance measures. Did you provide electricity and was it as cheap as it could have been? Um, but then adding that um, additional dimension and um, changing your changing your actions accordingly. And so I also have the um, the framework that we came up with with IEA. Um, and another um, way of, break, of looking at things that we um, set up for um, kind of understanding what benefits for all or equitable distribution for all could really mean and understanding what must be achieved, correcting disparities and achieving outcomes for um, the Black and Brown Indigenous communities and um, non-English speaking communities, highly impacted um, communities where like, census tracts where there's a higher concentration of, of low income um, or high, uh, high, a higher concentration of adverse health impacts relative to other spaces. Um, so where you can really see that, like, see this kind of the disparity in, um, play out. Um, and just moving towards a better place and seeing what's in the control of utilities um, under the clean energy transition. What, what must they do? What can they do? Um, and then how can they do better? And so wanting to sort of think of that um, in the context of um, the seed obligations. And um, thinking about equity, energy equity metrics is a big part of the advocacy work, uh, of the work um, in Washington across the board has been how do you think about this? Um, how is data data being pulled to um, to cast a light in certain areas or other areas? And how do you also want to make sure that it's not um, incomplete or um, that it's not wholly analyzed, like held and analyzed by some entities that have like interests that don't necessarily align with what you know with equity values and principles? Um, and so, the environmental um, health disparities map um, has been a key tool for um, seeing the spreads um, around different geographic um, areas in Washington. And there's a lot of information about that online. Uh, I could speak more, but I think my time is running a little low. Um, but in addition to that tool, 
which is to kind of see the concentration and um, it's supposed to have died entities like entities with with power and resources um, in case like utilities have to make a lot of decisions around um, you know, siting and then also taking down assets um, which are determined to be harmful um, resourcing and um, and hiring all manner of decisions how can um, this type of tool be used to um, to ensure that 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 data about where there are higher impacts and higher concentrations of adverse um, situations relative to the lower impacts, which are usually higher wealth, higher white um, um, areas. And then utilities, uh, what's kind of within utility control already? Like what's what's easy? Um, it, that's gonna be some, some entities are gonna be thinking like, how can we try to comply with CETA by, taking what we already do and doing more of it. Like let's throw more money at these programs, um, these like community programs. And if we can say that, that people are benefited or we can say that um, emissions are, are reduced because of the tree planting program or whatever it is, like um, some, some are very good programs, but um, just investing more in um, kind of community-based um, Oh, certainly relationships with community-based organizations, but in, in those types of programs are will be critical, but isn't enough. And so wanting to ensure that equity, energy equity metric setting is it really goes across like an uh, impact understanding of what utilities are are doing for um, for their energy um, kind of production, distribution, and um, operations. Um, so we're pushing for that, for that. Um, equity lends over everything um, and the highest possible kind of beneficial outcome um, from the equity, like from the, the metrics and indicators that utilities adopt. Um, and then we think maybe some utilities are determined to have like as, as few obligations as possible um, and they want to, they will end up wanting to adopt metrics um, and the indicators that um, show we put money towards towards these programs and we kind of we adopted kind of this thing um but it, it, it won't necessarily have as big an income as an impact as we know is possible um if this lens is applied applied more um broadly so i'm going to take one more minute to go through um some of the processes that we are in to come up with what those equity metrics are and where, where we're seeing some of the interplay, like some of the um, different ideas around um, what's what's really important, who um, who is impacted by what and how, who should receive benefits, how, um, and what methodologies need to be applied to make sure that's done in a way that kind of makes sense. Um, whether a guidance needs to come from like the UTC, whether it needs to come from the governor or the legislature, um, or whether it's kind of more, um, I, I want to say grassroots, but it's going to be a mix between mostly utilities kind of coming up with something internal, putting it out, getting public input, and then saying, look, we, look, we did it, um, and some back and forth with um, kind of stakeholders like advocacy organizations. Um, and then the equity advisory groups are a requirement for the three investor-owned utilities in Washington. Um, I'm on one of the one of the utilities groups, but um, it has it's been one um, one forum where been directly consulted by the utility and had um, had more a lot more input on what like how they come up with um, like what ultimate metrics they land on. And um, I just wanted to shout out and I was going to break down some different um, metric areas for the um, in the different categories that. Came up in an IEJ report that we that front and center gave some um, feedback on, um, but energy access and, and um, affordability is like energy burden, um, reduction of energy burden, or how much of um, out of household income how much it has to go towards paying energy bills, um, procedural justice and democracy, um, relation to um, how much decision making. Um, uh, how much communities are consulted in decisions around um, uh, any transition processes, community ownership and economic participation, a lot around um, workforce development and what are the labor standards for um, the new jobs um, and the shifting jobs that are impacted or that are created from having to, to go off of fossil fuel um, 
towards renewable. Um, and then how, are, how can that be more community-based, some of the economic um, opportunities. And then health and environmental impacts, of course, air quality, um, pollutants, and um, reducing those numbers. Like those are clear numerical forms of seeing benefits generated and then um, harms reduced. Um, and then I, I threw out some, I hope we have some time to possibly discuss. Um, on the left, we have the customer benefit indicators. Those are specific categories of indicators that IOUs have to come up with in Washington. Um, they have to name an indicator and they have to, um, the weighting factor for how they're kind of arriving at whatever numbers they get to. Um, and then they have to show improvement over time and this take state the specific actions they're going to take to show that improvement. So you can see those are pretty general, but it's something, um, at least it's like a number, it's a kind of a, a guiding list. COUs don't have that, um, but they do have to do something. Um, and then in the red are some of the more qualitative um, types of indicators that one IOU has come up with in a draft, and then the blue are um, another IOU. And so I thought if we had a chance for discussion, I was going to throw out um, what um, audience members or participants thought around measurement, measuring some of these, um, and then other equity-related um, dimensions like, like dignity. I don't think we have time, um, but a lot of um, what I've shared is really about, um, we're working through a lot. I, I don't, I'm not gonna have all the answers, and, but um, it's really important that the work happens um, and the discussions are, are live and that there's pushback when people try to shut down equity or silo it. Um, five minutes for Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Mark. We definitely are running a little low on time, but for a good reason, all of that is such important work um, and super interesting. So thank you again. Um, yeah, so we'll move into a brief question and answer. Um, we might go a little bit over the hour if we can, but of course people are free to stay as long as they like. Um, I'm gonna try to prioritize questions that are specifically relevant to what was presented today. Um, so apologies if we don't get to your question, um, but I'll try to move somewhat quickly. Um, so this first question I'm gonna ask is from Martin. Um, Martin asks, if, what if entities such as utilities claim using a different scorecard for equity and does IEJ assess such alternative methods? Um, so, I would direct that question probably to Susan or Haley if one of you wants to try and answer it. Yeah, um, I'm happy to take that and merge in a few. I saw four questions, uh, Martin, Steve, Heather, and Kathleen. I'll try to tackle those so we can get some more questions in. Um, but uh, the short answer for Martin's question is um, right now the scorecard um, is, is our own methodology, it's, it's got this whole thing. So it doesn't include other scorecards. Um, but what we would do is just like continue to iterate um, in all the different resources and tools and ask the question, what are folks looking at? What have we looked at? Is there anything missing? And you know, in future iterations, maybe we should you know, look at other things if there's anything that's missing. Um, you know, so one of those things, for example, the question about nuclear power is just one element um, in the scorecard methodology. And so the way this and other things have been considered is that, is that this is a scorecard about the most equitable and just policies. And so, you know, there's complicated questions and whole debates about different types of renewable energy, but at the end of the day, different sources have different impacts on communities. Um, and so those things need to be taken into consideration. So to try to develop a scorecard is, you know, obviously really complex. Um, but we want to just build in some of these factors to consider them um, and so that there is this tool to sort of grapple with this sort of methodology. Um, there were a couple of questions, if you don't mind me jumping in to, to answer these two, um, that sort of relate to each other. Um, there's a question about um, limiting the conversation towards energy assistance and energy burden. And how do we push beyond that? Um, or how do we also go beyond the, um, this conversation and craft policy that forces utilities to focus on justice um, beyond just profit. And so a couple of thoughts, it's part of why, to the first question, we created a really clear list like of five questions 
you know, only one is really specifically about energy access and assistance. So we wanted to make the point, there's a lot that you're missing if that's the only place you are. And with the metrics, we were also trying to do something very similar, like, you know, what else could you measure around health, around wealth, jobs, who owns the, the energy businesses that are thriving? Um, so, you know, naming a number of these other points is a way to sort of push utilities and push the commission beyond some of the low hanging fruit of only looking at income, which is important, but, you know, income and bill assistance is just one of these many pieces. And so even with just rethinking policy around profit, we, we hope that some of those questions also ask questions of community governance. So I'll stop there and hopefully I have time um, to shift to some of the questions to Mario. Awesome, thank you, Sabrin. Uh, yeah, it looks like we have a couple of uh, CETA specific questions. Um, one asks, does CETA address reliability and impact of communities? Or is there a need for other policies to address this problem? Another says, uh, are we working on, or is building efficiency in, is efficiency in buildings <laughs> a part of CETA? Um, Marielle, I don't know if you want to speak to uh, those questions or have comments about what was asked. Okay, um, let's see. Building efficiency, not in CETA. Um, and, um, it addresses reliability, not directly. Um, energy security is named as an area that needs um, that needs to be um, like benefits and burdens that need to be assessed relative to energy security. And in that, we're reading and resilience and resiliency. And in that, we're reading making sure that people have access to power that they need. Um, but it doesn't name specific obligations under that. Um, but we we're hoping to bake that into. Um, Kind of the priorities that utilities adopt in the metrics that they um, that they take on for themselves and prioritize um, reducing outages um, and brownouts and blackouts, particularly in communities which experience them at highest frequency um, and kind of low income and highly impacted communities. Great, right, thank you so much. Uh, all right, well, we are just about uh, ready to wrap up, but I'm going to pose one last question um, to Sivan and Marielle. Um, so please feel free to hang around and catch this last bit. But um, this will be recorded and the recording will be on the IEJ website in a couple of days. So if you have to go, uh, you can always check back and see what was said later on. Um, so for a wrap up question, uh, why don't you both tell me um, what you think the biggest takeaway is from uh, a tool like the scorecard and what you envision or hope um, using the scorecard in these kind of situations will uh, empower community advocates to, to do now that they might not have been able to do before. Sivan, if you wanna start. Sure, yeah, thank you. I'd say if I had to boil it down, um, particularly focusing on the role of practitioners in this space, um, this, our scorecard and the metrics are not meant to be the answer, but you know, it's meant to help illuminate how to transit, how to get from the dreams and solutions that communities develop into reality and action. And so the scorecard is hopefully one tool to really make more concrete those, those dreams that are continuing to be developed and continuing to evolve. And so, you know, if it's either, whether it's the scorecard or something else, similarly trying to break down and dissect and hold people accountable through like clear measurements is what we hope this scorecard and these metrics um, could provide. And if, and if it's not this, that hopefully they inspire folks on the ground using similar tools um, to sort of break down and define and then hold um, decision makers accountable um, you know, with a, a framework like this. And, and um, you know, this, this process can happen on the flip side from those that are at the helm of decision making and policy making, but um, you know, I think that's what I'd focus on um, for folks in the advocacy and practitioner space. Thank you, Ariel. Do you want to add anything? Oh, I think Marielle, you're, you're on mute. Oh, no, um, the scorecard process. Um, it happened after, of course, clean energy. Uh, came to Washington and even looking at the law. Um, 
and ex having experienced the rule making process, I see areas, okay, this, this could be better, this could be way better. Um, and then having looked at the scorecard um, and understand having applied that value, that, um, that type of evaluating kind of lens. Um, this will set us up for amendments in the future or for um, kind of interpreting the where where equity um, is is important um, and that it's missing and that we see it missing in how implementation plays out. Um, so I, I think of the scorecard as as live in in many ways um, and all sorts of kind of framing for measuring equity, putting it in a way that you you cannot deny that. And there are disparities there and you cannot deny that there's power to change that um, and where that power is concentrated they there needs to be pressure to move it towards the change um, so the scorecard i think is a, is um, a critical tool for that and um, i think a lot more will be coming out of iej that can help us with PETA and um and energy equity in washington well thank you all uh thank you to our attendees, uh, we are so grateful to have you here with us today um, and to stand in solidarity with you all in this work. Thank you to our fantastic panelists, Marielle, Sivan, and Kaylee. Uh, once again, this is recorded, so it will be on the IEJ website in a couple of days. Um, and yeah, just thank you all for being here. Um, this is really important work and we're so happy to be able to share all of this with you. So. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.